Now let's continue our assessment of what is likely to define Nigeria's 2023 elections. There are of course things like inflation and the high cost of living and whether the macroeconomic levers to deal with that are down to the presidency or the central bank. Well, there is also the bigger picture, how the rest of the world, for instance, is seeing that ballot and whether it is a measure of democratic transition in Africa and a sort of regional example of what a handover of power should look like on the continent. Are we, to some extent, taking for granted how politically stable Nigeria is? With more of this, I'm joined now in the studio by a senior academic fellow at the African Studies Center at Oxford University, Sonny Iroche, who is also a council member of the Joint Ministerial Council on Industry, Trade and Investment between Nigeria and South Africa. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Let me put that question to you. I mean, are we to some extent, from your kind of international perch, are we to some extent taking for granted how stable politically Nigeria is? Because despite all the issues around preparations and irregularities around elections, there seem now to be there seems now to be a guarantee of a democratic transition. So everyone looking at Nigeria as a sort of regional example of what a handover of power looks like. Is that a fair assessment or is that too optimistic? Thank you very much, Charles. I don't think it's uh, too optimistic because Nigeria in uh, 2015, uh, Jonathan handed over to uh, Buhari and it's up to Buhari to ensure that what he benefited from, from transition from Jonathan to, uh, to himself, he passes on to whoever uh, wins the 2023 20, elections. Nigeria is a very resilient country. Uh, people from abroad would uh, think there's, uh, uh, rightly so, think that there's instability, but somehow we try to wiggle out our way. But I think the international com uh, community has put Nigeria on hold for now. Uh, no fresh investments are coming in. Uh, things are really, really bad in Nigeria. Inflation is at almost 19% uh, uh, unemployment. And our students in Nigerian universities have been at home since February. And it's so sad that in this same country that we cannot negotiate with uh, the academic staff union, we are giving 1.4 billion to buy cars for uh, Nigeria Republic. Yeah, I'm going to come to that later, but the economy that you brought up is going to be such a key part of this election. Politicians pledging that they're going to deal with this cost of living crisis that you were talking about and so on. But can whoever wins deliver on the promises made? Or is there absolutely no chance that any of the candidates can fulfill the promises they're making given the debt crisis and the fact that the fiscal space has almost completely eroded as you hinted there? Yes, it's very important that whoever emerges as the president of Nigeria come 2023 comes with a team that understands the issues at stake. It's not going to be easy. It's not, going to be, it's not supposed to be business as usual. You have to assemble a strong economic team that will look at the president eyeball to eyeball and tell him what is possible within the short term, what is possible mid medium term, mm. and what is possible long term. And we must reach out to foreign development partners, the export credit agencies, and market Nigeria to them, and assure them that their investments are safe in Nigeria, and that government must create an enabling environment for business to thrive. There must be security. We must have to look into our infrastructure. Power is also very key to any development of any nation. So I expect that whoever aspires to be president to lead us mm. out of this hole we've put ourselves in must be prepared must now come up with with a plan mm. tell nigerians what you're going to do uh, that's a good thing for people to be looking out for when yes, the campaigns exactly. begin not name calling just mm. go tell us what they're going to do for nigeria and, and wearing your trade and investment hat um you, you, you were just talking a moment ago about the donation of vehicles by Nigeria to Niger Republic. What's your reaction to that? I mean, do you see 
the strategic importance of such a gesture. Um, the donation apparently had a value of 1.4 billion naira. It's like a father who cannot pay his children's school fees, giving his neighbor money to buy a luxury. If uh, the Buhari government had to, if for whatever reasons that we don't know, has to give vehicles to uh, the Jerry Republic, what stops him from giving them uh, innocent motors from Newi in Anambra State? Why is it Land Cruiser from Japan? I, I mean, our president should be our chief marketer. Our president should be the one selling Nigeria to the outside world. I, I, I'm so sad on two, on, two, on two levels. One level, you have no money. The country is almost is bankrupt. And now you take what we don't have and give to uh, a neighboring country. No, mm. it, 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 it's, and it's not just the neighboring country. It's also going to Japan because they're the ones going, who are exactly, producing the Japan, vehicles. Yeah. I mean, it, right. it, it, I, I, I'm rather inclined to agree with you because it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. It doesn't. You, you would want to spare your own industry, exactly. and you're talking about localizing manufacturing and all the rest of it. And someone's making cars that are good quality, good quality cars. Yeah. Why aren't you promoting them? But let, let's move on from there. Um, because you, you also sit on the board of the NGO Book Aid for Africa, or BAFA. You were talking about the, the crisis in, at, at Nigerian state universities. I mean, how is the, that NGO supporting education in Nigeria and in Africa? I understand you yourself have considerable involvement in education in Nigeria. Yes, thank you very much, Charles. Uh, Book Aid uh, for Africa is a UK-based uh, NGO that supports African uh, secondary and tertiary institutions with free books, but you pay for your shipment, and shipment is not uh, uh, that expensive, and books are usually duty-free. So uh, we've supplied books to a number of schools around Africa, in uh, Nigeria. We supplied books to Premier Academy, uh, to some universities, to uh, Mozambique, to Tanzania, and uh, we're looking at uh, donating books to uh, the Abia League of Professionals, which I also uh, head, mm. and those books will arrive any moment now. So that's it. I mean, so universities, secondary schools that are interested in getting books in different uh, areas, particularly science, mathematics, languages, French, and so on. So we have a warehouse in uh, Newcastle that are full of books, and uh, the, the, uh, the school system in the UK supports us by giving us free books, new books, some fairly used books, and uh, that, that's it. Mm. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, and you are, of course, a senior academic uh, fellow at Oxford, uh, watching and analyzing developments in Nigeria and Africa from there. Um, our next guest is going to be talking about the Kenyan elections, but how do you assess that election in relation to the Nigerian presidential election a few months later? It, it, it's, it's so funny and it's also an irony. Uh, Raila Odinga, uh, his father was the first vice president of, uh, of Kenya. Mm. And Raila now is 77 and is heading a coalition of parties. Whereas uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, who had been his rival, but in 2018, they had a handshake of peace and reconciliation. And the opposition president is supporting Raila Odinga mm based, I'm sure, on the reconciliation that, listen, my family and your family have been political rivals for a long time. I think it's time for the Baba, as they call him in Kenya, like we used to call Obasanjo Ya Baba, they call him Baba at 77, as opposed to the vice president of, uh, of uh, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta himself, who is 55. So I've always maintained that leadership is not necessarily about age. I believe that the task of nation building should be a mutual responsibility between the young and the old. The old contributing experience and maturity, while the young collaborates with audacity and diversity. President Reagan was one of the greatest presidents of America. He was 69. And we've had in Nigeria young politicians. Well, he was the, much older than 69. No, uh, no, I mean Reagan. No, Reagan was 69. Ronald yeah, Reagan. Yeah, Ronald Reagan was 69 when he ran for presidency of the, yeah. You mean the first time he? The, the first time he ran was 69. Right. Okay. okay, I, I thought uh, you meant when he became president. No, when, when he became president, he was 69. He was the oldest until Biden 
who's uh, 70 something, whatever it is. Uh, I think it's no, 77. I, I, I think Reagan was older than that. But anyway, yeah, let, let's, anyway let's, let's not waste but time. We've seen that. in Nigeria where you say young people, okay, young people want to lead. That's fine. I mean, I got uh, in, the, in, in, our, in our first uh, House of Representatives in Nigeria, mm -hmm. we had a 29 year old uh, speaker who faked his school that he went to university that he did not attend. He's a young man, 29. Right. We have some governors and political office holders who are young who have committed heinous uh, corruption crimes. So what is important is the value and the preparedness of a leader to lead okay. uh, a country or a state. Uh, Sonny Iroche, I want to thank you very much indeed. And Sonny is a senior academic fellow at the African Studies Center at Oxford University. <laughs>